Hey guys, it's Hunter. Welcome back to another episode of Ask Fish. So a quick little update before we get into your questions. I'm doing a special Mola run of guitars with Valiant Guitars out of Ukraine, and the pre-order pages are now up. Valiant had the unfortunate timing of starting up right as their country was f***ing invaded. They had to evacuate their workshop for a while because soldiers were in the area, a cruise missile hit nearby, made the building unsafe, damaged the infrastructure, and that still hasn't stopped them making some truly incredible guitars. Last month I unboxed a Valiant Jupiter and Shell Pink, that's one of the guitars you can now pre-order. Aged nitro finish, stainless steel frets, bare knuckle polymath pickups, roasted ironwood fingerboard, duralumin hardware, bell brown saddles, Daddario locking tuners. It's a super cool sleeper guitar disguised as a vintage instrument. The other, the Smith, is a more contemporary looking single cut, ebony fingerboard, bare knuckle war pig, goto locking tuners. Again, stainless steel frets, duralumin hardware, bell bronze saddles, and this one even has a nut with bell bronze slots. This is a project I'm really proud to be a part of. These guys have shown valiant isn't just a company name. They're trying to rebuild their company, help their country recover. Obviously, getting parts right now is really difficult for them, but their plan is to try to make 25 of each, so super limited. They'll be individually numbered, have the Mola Mola logo, and a portion of the revenue will be donated to save the children who are on the ground in Ukraine providing assistance to children and families affected by war. These are boutique, legit, custom shop level instruments, so I understand they're not cheap. They have a payment plan, 110 bucks, then 50% when the guitar ships, the other 50% within 30 days of receipt to make sure you love it. It's quite a bit of money, but the quality, the components, the craftsmanship, it's all custom shop level. It's ridiculously good. And it's not just me saying that. Daryl Braun, Phil McKnight, Chris Robertson of Blackstone Cherry, all super impressed with what they're doing, and especially given their extra challenging circumstances. So yeah, just wanted to let you know you can pre-order those now. Link's in the description with all the specs and details and everything. And you can follow them on Instagram too, show them some support. I know they'd really appreciate that. I'll have full in-depth videos of these dropping soon as well. They inspired some exceptional riffage. In the meantime, you guys had questions over on Discord. I've been told that smacking is too aggressive, so lightly nudge that like button. It actually really helps out with the enraged and unpredictable bucking bronco that is the YouTube algorithm. And let's jump into your questions. New World Man asks, thoughts on Gibson possibly doing an 84 reissue? Eyes emoji. Eyes emoji indeed. Is it finally happening? So Cesar G, Gibson's chief tease officer, has posted a picture posing in the Gibson development lab with an 84 Explorer in aged white. Now, what legendary guitarist who inspired a shitload of musicians to pick up guitar, myself included, is known for playing aged white 84 Explorers? Is James motherfucking Hetfield getting a Gibson signature? At the very least, it looks like the 84 Explorer is making a return to the Gibson lineup in some way, shape, or form. And the immediate dead giveaway with this Explorer is the triangle control layout. That's something they did from 1984 to 1987. And the 84s are particularly renowned because that was the only year it overlapped with when Gibson was putting Dirty Fingers pickups in the Explorers. And Dirty Fingers sound f***ing good. Plus the fact that James' most famous Gibson Explorer the So What guitar is an 84 and it was used to record Ride the Lightning with the stock pickups because he only started using EMGs around 1987. And his more beer guitar is also an 84, so he's pretty much synonymous with 1984 Explorers, at least on the Gibson side. And that's why people are speculating that this could be a signature, even though it doesn't have his signature EMGs. But remember, Kirk's signature prototypes don't have his EMGs either. The most compelling evidence is the color. It's not a new looking, pristine, alpine white Explorer. It's an aged, yellowing white. Gibson doesn't really do that for new standard lineup USA models. They let the nitro finishes age naturally, except with signature models. The Adam Jones Les Paul Standard, for example, was given the aged, silver burst color. So the logical conclusions are either this is a custom shop run, which would break my heart, or this is a signature model. Now, Cesar is known for teasing things intentionally, and he's taken this picture right next to a couple of interesting guitars in the background. Specifically, we've got Kirk Hammett's Purple Flying V and an unfinished prototype of Kirk's Floyd Rose equipped Modern. So he's taken this picture with other Metallica guitars clearly visible in the background. Hmm. So it could be an epic troll, or is James Hetfield finally getting a Gibson signature? That would be f***ing insane. Gibson would sell a million of them. They've long since blocked ESP from making any, 
That's why they've got the snake bite, and they've also inexplicably discontinued the 84 Explorer on both the Gibson and the Epiphone sides. Epiphone used to have a 1984 Explorer with EMGs that was really cool, an obvious Metallica nod, and when they discontinued it only a couple of years ago, the speculation then was it was to make way for a potential Hetfield signature. And now it might finally be happening. Come on, Gibson, release the Hetfield collection, you cowards. With that bold statement, if and when it happens, I'm gonna claim partial credit. But the fact this picture is taken right next to Kirk's models and the aged white instead of looking brand new, I want to say this is happening. At the same time, I mean, they announced Dave Mustaine and Kirk Hammett were joining Gibson family and getting Gibson signature collections long before any of their models were teased. There haven't been any rumblings of Hetfield going Gibson and already we have this potential signature. My new speculation based on absolutely nothing is that this is a prototype signature they'll send to James to try to get him on board. If he likes it, maybe he gets announced as a Gibson artist next year. You know, he said the reason that there's an ESP Iron Cross but never a Gibson Iron Cross even though it's based on a 1973 Gibson Les Paul was that it was a nightmare working with previous management. But now, Kirk's been on tour and in the studio with his Gibson prototypes all year. His experience working with the current Gibson team and the prospect of a Gibson Hetfield collection for the fans has probably come up at least once or twice. Either way, Metallica is my favorite band of all time. I'm just psyched that they're bringing the 84 Explorer back into the lineup. And in aged white, I don't even like Explorers, but I fucking want that one. Even if it's not an official signature, let's be real, Gibson probably owes James Hetfield some sort of royalty on every one of those sold. But yeah, we're just gonna have to wait and see what comes of this. On a kind of related note, Cody of Wage War also just posted a picture of him with an Explorer. That would be an interesting development in the current metalcore scene since he's been a big Fender guy. Wage War in general is a Fender band. They use Jim Root Jazzmasters, Tele Deluxes, Cody even had a regular Jazzmaster with an EMG just chucked in there. Don't know if he bought it or Gibson gave it to him, but it could be a part of an Explorer push on Gibson's end. This year is kind of the unofficial year of the V. Dave Mustaine finally had his signature models released much to Glenn Fricker's chagrin. Kirk Hammett's been using his Purple V live. Adam Jones has been using his ironically Dean-esque reverse Silver Burst V. Gibson's been treating the Flying V and the Explorer as odd partners in crime. Since they're pushing the V, I would not be surprised if they're trying to show the Explorer some more love especially with the much hyped 84 now on the horizon. But yeah, what do you guys think? Is the 84 a Hatfield signature? Is it a custom shop reissue? A return to the Gibson USA production line? Any and all thoughts, what are you thinking? Leave your thoughts down below. A quick note on Metallica, by the way. Did you guys know they're apparently canceled now? Yes, it seems TikTok has turned its ugly head and now all the new Gen Z fans are canceling Metallica even after they welcome new fans because that's what Gen Z does. They cancel shit. Or at least that's what article titles on metal websites would have you believe. All the articles are about one short video. Most of the points are stretches at best. The rest are taken out of context. In fairness, there is one alleged and unproven he said, she said story that's actually pretty bad, but there's a certain irony to the video. The creator's content is all uh, why your favorite artist is problematic expose videos. Yeah, you know, creators like this look for anything because they need a video. A lot of the points end up being out of context reaches. It just dilutes any real arguments she would have about legitimately problematic artists. It's just lazy content. Uh, but anyways, the creator only has about 45,000 followers. And I'm not saying that's a small amount. I'm just saying she doesn't have millions of followers and it's just, it's just one video. Like metal fans are up in arms. It's really not that big a deal though. A lot of the article titles are rage bait designed to get the metal community all riled up, you know, cause like that's the only thing people read when it's posted to Facebook. Um, yeah, it's all just very dumb. You know what's not dumb though? You. If you use today's sponsor to get your music onto Spotify and Apple Music, let's take a quick second and thank DistroKid for sponsoring today's video. Look, we love talking about new guitars, new gear. It's all very exciting, especially if it's an 84 Explorer. But the real exciting part is the music you create with it and then getting that music out into the world. And Districate is the easiest way to get your music onto all the major platforms. Spotify, Apple Music, 
all of them. DistroKid takes all the hard work out of it. Uploading is just a few clicks. If it's a cover, they'll even help you get the license. That is massive. And a big reason as to why I and so many other people love and use DistroKid is because they're musician focused. The platform is always growing, always evolving to serve the modern artist. There's promo cards to advertise new releases on social media, social phone to communicate with your most loyal fans via text. You can easily get verified Spotify and YouTube music accounts through DistroKid. And one of my favorite features is splits. These days, everyone's collaborating with everyone. Maybe you've got a featured guest on the track. Maybe it's as simple as everyone in your band wants an equal share of the streaming revenue. Andrew Bain and I made a metal cover of the Fox NFL theme. It turned out pretty epic. And it was also epically easy to set up splits with DistroKid. Literally uploaded, set the percentage, and now I don't have to hit Banna up with repeated Venmo requests for my share of the TikTok money. It arrives directly to me. DistroKid doesn't take any cuts. All the revenue earned from your music is yours. Pricing starts at just 20 bucks a year for unlimited uploads, but if you use my link in the description, you can snag a bonus discount. Plus, it supports the channel by letting them know that I sent you. So if you got music to show the world, DistroKid is the way to do it. So go check them out. And while you're doing that, let's get back into your questions. Obsessed with Baritone Guitars asks, did you ever play with Legos? If so, what was your favorite set? Yeah, of course, man. Lego Star Wars was the best. Uh, my brother and I had a pretty solid Lego collection going. He had the X-Fighter, I had the Naboo Starfighter. Legos got damn expensive though, so I'm not gonna lie. A couple of years ago, my friend and I got the Nostalgia Bug, bought a Laypin Millennium Falcon off AliExpress. Got a couple of bottles of wine, built it together on her stream. It was a good ass time, even if not all the pieces fit that well together. Uh, but yeah, any more Lego enthusiasts out there? Or I guess, um, Laypin enthusiasts too? Juan TW55 asks, what do you think about the new Slipknot singles that were released recently? Right, so there are three new Slipknot singles out for their upcoming album. The first one, Chapel Town Rag, I didn't like it too much. It was kind of all over the place. The most recent one, Yen, is okay. I've actually got a reaction video out on the dying song, Time to Sing. So far, that's been my favorite of the three new singles. The way I feel about them is kind of summed up in that video. There are elements of the old Slipknot that got me into them, elements of the modern, mature Slipknot that I've grown up with. But there's something about them where as soon as I'm done listening to them, they don't really linger in my head for that long. None of them have the instant earworm replay button breaking qualities of uh, duality before I forget, psychosocial, heretic anthem, people equal shit. You know, they're classics. It is still Slipknot though. They're goaded. The keg is undefeated. Even if I'm a bit meh on the new album so far, more than anything, these have got me extra stoked to see them again on Not Fast Roadshow. Slipknot put on a goddamn metal spectacle. What about you guys though? What do you think of the new Slipknot singles? Love them, hate them, meh on them? Pink Zane asks, what's the one that got away? I assume you mean in a guitar context, like what guitar did I miss out on that I still think about? And uh, you know, I've actually thought about this quite recently. I was at Wendell's this week. We were working on one of the 81 Sonics projects. <laughs> it needed some body reforming. It's so bad. But anyways, there was a girl in there. She was super cool, younger than me, but knew exactly what the 40 year old Sonics was. How it's got the mahogany core surrounded by toilet bowl material, as Wendell calls it. And she was like, oh, I saw your video series on the vintage Les Paul custom rebuild and rest mod been looking, but thanks to you, I can't buy any Les Paul custom husks anymore. Now, I would not say that I'm fully to blame, you know, less than 100,000 views per video, but she was right about the pricing and availability of these Les Paul custom husks. On the rare occasion, a Les Paul custom husk pops up now, even the Norlands that no one f***ing wanted before are ridiculously expensive now. I had my eye on this one last week, nothing special, but three and a half f***ing grand for a husk. When I got mine, especially the 72, I'm telling you, the narrative was Norlands are a piece of sh No one wanted them. It was like a thousand bucks for the husks and they wouldn't be completely f like my 74 was. A full Norlin Les Paul custom with all stock parts, at the time it was like less than three grand. Make Norlin guitar prices great again, right? But there was one husk in particular, listed pretty much the next week after I got my 72. It was an early 70s husk, uh, which I really like because it's got the volute and the really thin neck. I really couldn't afford it because I was a broke ass college student, 
I still should have gotten it though. No one wanted this one. It went for like 750, 800 in the end. Uh, completely refinished in pink sparkle. I'm talking the E2 Eclipse Sparkle. And I guess that just wasn't cool yet. No breaks, no gouges, nothing. The resale value had just been f***ed because it had been completely refinished in this dope ass pink sparkle and the cereal was gone. Obviously no original parts, but the refinish was clean. They even did the headstock and I've always had a thing for pink and purple guitars. Sometimes the less metal something is, the more metal it is. You know what I mean? The irony and counterculture just be like that sometimes. So anyways, every time I see an expensive husk now, I think about that guitar. I also think about another one that popped up a couple of years later. It was a husk of a 90s Les Paul Studio, black with an ebony board. It wasn't a particularly good deal or anything. Uh, in fact, it was kind of overpriced at the time for what it was. It was around 500 bucks. It had a repaired headstock break. And at the time you could get a whole ass Les Paul Studio on Craigslist for that money. Anyways, the reason I wanted it it was a birth year Gibson Les Paul. Not only that, it was stamped the exact day that I was born. So that would have been a really cool one to mod to my specs. And it's very unlikely I'll ever come across that kind of deal. A birth date Les Paul Husk ever again. As far as full guitars go, I'll admit I'm a bit jealous every time Pete Cottrell breaks out the Fender 66. Downsized jazz body, coolest guitar Fender's made in years. Petition to bring that back. Player Plus 66, anyone? But nah, those two Les Paul Husks haunt me in a way that the 66 just doesn't. What about you guys though? Let's hear your sob stories. What are the ones that got away? Echomode asks, heard about Buckethead got 10 of his guitars stolen, frowny face. Man, I don't know if it's a new phenomenon or we just hear about it a lot more because of social media, but guitar theft from storage lockers seems to be happening all the time. And it's happened to Buckethead, known of course for being a fantastic guitar player who plays guitar with a KFC bucket on his head. Now, at the time he'd made a statement on his site saying 10 of his most important guitars were stolen left an email address for people to contact him, and that was it. Not really too helpful. No pictures, no serial numbers or anything. He also asked for two studio Les Pauls, and it was unclear what he meant by that. Did that mean his signature studios, regular Les Paul studios? Instructions unclear. Seems to have had somewhat of a good ending though. He's updated his website with a handwritten message from Taylor Bellamere, I think I'm pronouncing that right, who managed to help Buckethead recover one of his stolen guitars, as well as a photo of 11-year-old Taylor in the front row of a Buckethead show in 2008, playing that same guitar that he helped recover. F***ing wholesome. Apparently the guitar was sold at an Arizona swap meet, and it was recognized as Buckethead's own guitar because it had a black headstock, whereas all the production signatures came with white headstocks. His signatures also had 27 inch baritone scale lengths, which is f***ing wild. Bring that back, please. But yeah, huge shout out to the Eagle Eyed fans and to Taylor for helping Buckethead recover one of his guitars. There's so much negative news out there, but this is super heartwarming. Now keep this on your radar. They'd been announced at this year's Anaheim Summer Nam, but the Ernie Ball Music Man HT series have now been released into the wild. Kind of, you can at least pre-order them from Sweetwater and Toman. Pricing has also been revealed. They're 300 bucks more than the non-HT versions. $28.99 for the Stingray and the Cutlass. Available in Raspberry Burst, Snowy Night, Yucatan Blue, Showtime, Brulee, and Midnight Rider. $36.99 for the Sabre in all the same colors, so a lot of cohesion within the line. Of course, they have roasted figured maple necks, stainless steel frets, those glorious necks with the hand rubbed oil finishes. I mean, those necks are so fing good. The big news is, of course, they come with Music Man's new HT pickups, which are supposed to be clear, more powerful, just better by using specialized heat treated materials in traditional designs. They've described this as a natural evolution of material based research they've undertaken with their strings. And the way they're talking about them in marketing materials, they almost sound like Fishman Fluence, super high fidelity, high output, but in a traditional pickup design. I tried desperately to get a Stingray HT for a demo. Love my Stingray RS, and I'm really curious about the HT pickups. I mean, it's a Strat style dual humbucker guitar with a tunematic. <laughs> it's so cool. But they said they already have a bunch of YouTube videos lined up for that and for the Sabre. My own fault, they were announced when I was on paternity leave and I waited so late to hit them up. And I haven't seen any videos yet besides the official launch video, but 
they're coming, so we should have more information soon. Can't wait to hear everyone's thoughts on the new pickups and whether that's the future of modern pickup design. Going in kind of the completely opposite direction, Kramer's released a new line of budget guitars, the Striker series. And in typical Kramer fashion, they have their sights set firmly on the 80s for inspiration. Comes in two variations, $399 for the Floyd, Probably a special at this price point, comes in majestic purple, jumper red, and ebony. There's also wild ivy and transparent red with flame maple veneers. Also comes in a 349 tunematic style hardtail variant, which I have to say, HSS Super Strat with a tunematic. That actually is pretty cool. Comes in transparent ebony and transparent purple, both with flame maple veneers. I actually kind of like the zebra pickup in the bridge as well. It gives it that aftermarket hot rotted look. But yeah, that's the Kramer update. Uh, listen, they know their current fan base. It's still waiting for them to release something ultra modern for contemporary metal players to think about and give Charvel a proper run for their money, because as it stands, they still have nothing for the core kids. Like, why? Even some Kramer prophecies would be cool, but I digress. This is about the Striker series, and uh, actually, that's all I have to say on those. But that'll do it for this episode of Ask a Fish. I really haven't uploaded too much this week. I've been putting in extra work for videos that I'm really excited to do. Writing with the Valiant guitars have been super fun because those guitars are so f***ing good. I'll let you be the judge when they drop, but I'm pretty sure they inspired some of the best riffs I've ever written. Bennett Wendell's filming footage of the Sonics Restamod. Some mysterious dude whose name may or may not rhyme with Pat Beefy sent me some fire leads for an upcoming demo track. And I've I've actually gotten back into the modding game here, so yeah, just a lot of cool shit. I haven't had time to actually sit down and talk to the camera much this week. A shout out to all my amazing patrons. You guys keep the channel going. Thank you so much for your support. If you want to join them in supporting the content and get bonus extras, link will be in the description. We're also so close to the next Patreon goal where we'll be upgrading everything to 4K make even better content for you guys. Social media, Discord, and affiliate links are down below. As always, thank you so much for watching. You've been awesome, and I will see you for the next video.